My name is Gaurav and it's so great to be with everyone today in, in this virtual world. I'm coming to you from Los Angeles, California in West Hollywood in a house I just recently renovated and built and I can just take you around real quick. Uh, here is like the living room, there's a little pool area and a, a kitchen. So this is where I am lucky enough to work from. And uh, yeah, it's, it's awesome. Um, I'm gonna start the presentation. Uh, again, uh, this is Bend Goods and we make wire furniture. It's indoor, outdoor wire furniture. And these are some of the different pieces that we create. Uh, this is, uh, a sofa of ours, a wire sofa, our take on a wire sofa. Uh, it's called the love seat. And this is one of uh, the Lucy chair in a bar stool version. And uh, here it's shown at a restaurant here in Los Angeles. And they are commercial grade. So uh, it's, it's fun to see them pop up when you're out. I see them out and about and, and it's like, oh my gosh, there they are. So it's, so it's kind of fun to see. Um, uh, and this is one of our bigger pieces. It's the cloud bench. Um, and this is uh, our uh, a side table. It's called the terrazzo. It has a terrazzo top on it. So mostly we work with metal and wire, but we, over the years, we've been adding uh, some different material to the wire. This is one example of it, this terrazzo top to it. Um, this is just a shot of a living room or dining room setup uh, of our Lucy chair. And uh, this is the wooden wire chair. It's one of our newer pieces. And this is uh, an outdoor shot of some of our pieces. So our product is indoor and outdoor. Um, and this is uh, a bigger piece called the, it's our take on the 1970s chair, or the peacock chair. And this is something a little bit more simpler. Uh, it's called the Rachel chair. So we have all these different products. Our philosophy has always been to kind of surprise everyone with what we do. And we've been doing this for 10 years. Uh, this is our 10th year. And we started off with five different pieces and expanded to that. And to, and, and to just a, that was just kind of a sample of some of the pieces that we're working on, that we built over the years. So it all started with these two people. And these two people are my parents. And they immigrated from India. Uh, many, many years ago. And that is me in my dad's hand. You can see a little, it's like back many years ago in 1972, and you can see there was no safety precaution uh, there. And I think uh, my dad was teaching me a lesson in risk or something, but uh, it was, it was uh, it's a very, I don't know, it's an it's interesting, interesting uh, picture. For me, anyways, um, these two people coming from India, trying to build, to build their life here in, in the United States. And they were always, they were very creative. They are very creative. My mother was always cooking and creating things. And my dad was an engineer. Um, he, uh, while he was an engineer, he started this, um, Back in the, I think in the 80s, he started where VHS tapes, these old VHS tapes where people would rent videos. He would, uh, instead, there was, uh, people would rent, would go to stores and rent videos. And he would actually, uh, he started this company where he would uh, deliver videos to homes around in the community. And it was called At Your Doorstep. And we kind of joke, like he invented Netflix, where nowadays you just download it, but he was actually going out and delivering it. So yeah, that was just kind of an inventive thing he would do. But 
Uh, both my parents are very supportive in what I've done and what I've been able to create. Of course, we've had our challenges like any family, but uh, they were, they've always been supportive. Um, so I grew up in the suburbs of Detroit and um, after graduating from college, not really knowing what, it, what I wanted to do, I know that I always liked to, liked to build things and make things, and I just didn't know how that was gonna happen. And after graduating from college, I got this job teaching Photoshop and Illustrator, and I was learning on the job. These are, this is like the mid-1990s, and uh, where technology and art was becoming a thing. So it was really interesting to see those two worlds kind of combine. And it really gave me a foundation. Being able to teach Photoshop and Illustrator gave me a great foundation uh, to be able to communicate how I wanted to design. And then after I uh, left, uh, after like the late 90s, Pixar was becoming a thing and I was like, I want to learn how to animate. So I went to animation school in Vancouver and I learned how to care, uh, make characters and animate those characters. And once I left that, I wasn't, I didn't get a job at Pixar, but I was able to, um, I, my mom saw this uh, ad in the newspaper. I went back to Detroit and she saw an ad in the newspaper uh, to work for an automo, uh, auto, des auto company, General Motors, and I started as a sculptor there and started designing interior and exterior vehicles. This is a full-size clay model of uh, something I worked on. Uh, what we do is what we do is we render things out in 3D. We got the collect the data in 3D, and then we milled it out in clay. And so here is a clay model, and then here is a full size vehicle in clay. So there are the 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 environment there was it was very design oriented. We would spend a year or more on designing a vehicle. There were these teams of people working together, creating line quality and, uh, on the vehicle um, and back and forth in the computer in the 3D world. We take that data in the 3D world and we would mill it out in clay. So it was a back and forth process. Um, but after a while, I, I was there for seven years and it, and it was a great learning experience. But after a while, I was always like needed to do my own thing. I wanted to make my own decisions and, and my family, is, I come from a family of entrepreneurs and uh, it was just like time for me to do something on my own. And I was always inspired by mid-century furniture uh geometric patterns macrame those things really kind of draw drew to, uh to me and um architecture was a huge part of what i do i love uh architecture and i was lucky enough to design the house that i live in now and this is a shot of a famous architect lee corbusier and I love love his architecture and I think it, you can see some sort of relation of his architecture and then even in the furniture that I create I feel like you can see something there um, the shapes the color the repetitiveness of the shapes I think you can pick things out um, and also I like interesting I love to play with shapes and see how we can really grow uh, change the shapes of things and really kind of grow and figure out where to go with our next product line. And that's what really gets me excited is figuring out what that's gonna look like. And this is from Didi Rams. He makes some amazing shapes of the products for Braun. He made them back in the day. So the, that was a big influence on me. Um, this is another architectural image. Uh, Macrame, like I mentioned, my mom was, uh, 
was really big into macrame back in the 70s and I kind of I think that had some sort of influence on that and um, yeah coming uh, growing up in Michigan we would spend summers and winters sometimes in California and Southern California because it was so different and this is a picture from Palms in Palm Springs and it um, really that whole California indoor outdoor living really played a big part in, in the product that I really wanted to create. Um, and this is an image of, uh, that just really inspired me. It was uh, in India. It's, you know, it's, a, it's, this, it's just a whole color and the, co the combinations of color, I think that really uh, played to me. And, and I think I picked that up from my background. And, and you can also see like uh, just relating to the product and some other past products. Uh, this is on the left, you'll see this is a captain chair and it's a, a wood chair from uh, I think the turn of the century in the 1900s that it was first developed and we took our made our own spin of it in our own in our wire form in the captain chair. You can see the relationship there. And here, uh, the chair on the left is from the Baja movement uh, from the 1980s, I think. And, and we really kind of took inspiration from that to create our, um, our cloud bench. And here on the right, you'll see is our wave table. And it, I think it really took inspiration from the 1970s um, uh, fabric patterns um, from, the, from that era. So after I left General Motors, it was like, I need to figure out what I want to do. I needed to do something on my own. And so I started sketching. I traveled the world and I just started meeting people. I needed to explore. I needed to uh, see what else was out there. And, I, and that's what I did and uh, started designing and sketching out sketches and trying to figure out what, that, what, what I was gonna do next. And I was always drawn to wire furniture. And so here's just kind of rough uh, ideas of what the Lucy chair was. And that was the first chair that I ever developed. It's a dining chair. This is not the Lucy chair. This is the, another picture of the captain chair, but I also made chairs in 3D um, and um, then this is a, an image from one of the first prototypes of the Lucy chair. Um, and we were just experimenting with shape. And here is another prototype from 2008 of the Lucy chair. And you can see that the patterns on the seat are very different from the patterns of what they are now. What I realized was the I wanted the chair comfortable as far as the wire chair. When people sit on it, I wanted it, them to know it was, I wanted them to feel comfortable. And people are always surprised when they sit in it that it is comfortable. But if you'll see on this version that the spacing of the triangles on the seat are very spread apart and that made it less comfortable. So I altered the design I changed it up and I put, all sort of, I put all these lines going across the seat so, um, so that would add to the comfort. So many people say when they sit on it that they're surprised, oh, that's a wire? Um, and they can sit on it for longer periods of time because the wires are closer together. Um, yeah, so it's interesting. We make samples, we design things, we sketch them out. Um, we make them in 3D, we make a real life prototype, and then once we see the prototype, we are able to sit in it and see what it really feels like. And then we, we create this beautiful thing, and then we tear it up all over again because we want to make it better. And that's what, uh, that's the process that we go through, and it's a fun process, and sometimes it's it uh, it's, goes on for a long time, too much uh, longer than you want it to go on, and sometimes it goes on really fast. 
Um, this is just me uh, playing around in the metal shop. And um, I did that earlier on, uh, uh, playing around in the metal shop, uh, just to get my, just to figure out uh, what I wanted to make. And sometimes I go back there, but uh, mostly a lot of the day, a lot of the time now is on the computer really uh, figuring things out then there. And then we make cardboard models of it after that. Uh, this is at the metal shop. You can see the, a wire, spools of wire. Uh, and the first step is just to cut down the wire. And on the left side of the picture is a, uh, is a whole bunch of cut wire. And this is a machine that helps us uh, uh, bend the wire because that's what we do, we bend wire. Um, and there are different ways to bend wire. And here is uh, another machine that bends wire. So it can be pretty repetitive, but um, then this is just, uh, here's another, uh, some more factory pictures of bending and cutting the wire. Sometimes we bend it by hand, uh, we weld, uh, we weld by hand, and we also grind it. Um, here is a welding on a big table that we created. Uh, we did some custom work for a client, and this is a uh, table that we welded together. Um, this is called TIG welding. And this is called spot welding. I think this is even me trying to weld it, and I'm not a good welder. Welding is really a skill, just like woodworking is a skill that needs to, that someone, that you need to develop up. over yeah. years. And here is kind of a finished factory shot of our hot seat. He's inspecting it. Next, after it's welded and, and, and uh, grinded, we go to the next phase, which is the powder coating, which is applying the finish onto the chair. And you can see he's loading up the gun, the powder coating gun, and he's spreading it on distributing it. And next, uh, so once he spread the powder coating on the chair, it's hung on uh, this rack and it's put into an oven that is baked. And it bakes the powder onto the chair. So that's what that was. Here, uh, just to show you more about our design process, this was the wave table that I had shown you earlier. We had uh, experimented with different ways to the way it would look. And this is a wire version of the wave, chair, uh, the wave table. We never de uh, designed this, or we never produced this, but because we felt like we should go to the, try another material. And so we went to sheet metal and we created this uh, sheet metal version of this table. And this version, uh, we learned from this process that it was really flimsy. It was kind of falling apart. So what we decided to do was add some wire to it to strengthen the edges so it wouldn't be uh, moving around. And that's what those purple lines are uh, that I drew on those purple lines uh, to tell uh, one of uh, uh, the prototype maker is to put that on the on the on the metal, and here is a finished uh, version of the where the purple lines were. Now we have wire onto that, and um, you can see another image of that where how they connects. 
And this is the finished product after it's been plated. Here's a video just to show you how strong our product is. Marketing is so important when you're in a business and showing how your product is being used. And we just, we like to show this video, like to show how durable the product is. Um, no dogs were harmed in making of this, um, this video. The dog really liked it. So. Here is a material we used. It's uh, a leather piece that we've uh, added to the chair. This piece is molded directly onto the chair and it has some intricate stitching on the back and the, um, and the front of it. And this leather piece can come on and off the chair. So we have a showroom in Los Angeles and this is some images of when we acquired the space, we constructed the space here. Uh, we had to do a lot of renovation um, there was a wall down the middle. We took the wall down and um, we did a lot of work to it. And here is uh, kind of the finish, uh, the way it looks, way it looks. We had created these sliding walls so uh, to separate the back of house from the front of house so people can walk in from the front door and um, enter that way and create like these kind of hidden spaces, kind of like almost like it was like a game show, like, like things would slide and open up and things would come out and um, things would uh, rotate around. So that's our showroom. Here's another shot of our showroom, back of house in the kitchen. Um, another shot of our showroom. The showroom has evolved over the, over the years. Yeah, we just, we just, it's sometimes challenging to find out, figure out how to create different vignettes. We have a lot of product that we want to show now, and it's, uh, it's hard to show all of it when and you want to show all of it, but you want to also keep it uh, clean and uh, keep it separate so people can see the different things where we are, that we offer a bar stools and lounge chairs and dining chairs and tables and side tables. We want to be able to show all of those things without, uh, without in a, in a one big environment. And recently our showroom was looted during the protest here in LA. Uh, so this is a shot uh, of that and we've had to board it up um, uh, and luckily nobody was hurt everybody is safe um, this is another shot of the showroom of some graffiti that happened um, yeah this is a cool video that we created a long time ago We can go ahead and switch over to Q&A. I just wanna let all the students watching know that you can submit your questions through the Q&A function, which you'll find either at the bottom or the top of your screen, depending on which device you're tuning in. So definitely go ahead and submit those. Um, you had mentioned that you were, were dealt with looting during the riots, and I know we have a question. Uh, someone had mentioned that they saw some social justice work paintings on a boarded up storefront. I believe that's the showroom itself. Right. You guys have done a really beautiful mural outside there. Uh, how do you think designers can do more for social justice movements? Yeah, that's a really great question. Uh, something we have really been thinking about uh, in internally here and it's also how do we communicate that message in a thoughtful way out in our social media and uh, that's really challenging uh, for us and I think for everybody 
the 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 looting happened and it nobody was hurt in 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 our in our sphere in our world and we're really appreciative of that uh, uh, yeah it, it does suck that stuff was taken and it's it is what it is and but it's at the end of the day it's just stuff that was taken and there are other things to be more aware of that people are dying every day because of their color of their skin and that's something that um, that we all need to be aware of and that we did have uh, a, another store in our community in our community on our street on Melrose approached us uh, and developed this idea of painting the, up the, all the storefronts by this uh, local artist and that's what we did and we invited people from the community to send to write positive messages on on the different storefronts uh, billboard and um, and we've been showing that on on social media so uh, just I think we need to all understand and be aware and um, how every and that everybody is going through something different than we have than I have been brought up or that you may have been brought up so we all should learn from one another for sure and um, so I, we're looking at ways to in, um, in have more people of color involved. I have a small team. Some of those people are of color. I ask them questions of how they feel about uh, something. Uh, we, we designed the product uh, uh, for Black Lives uh, Movement that we were going to donate all the proceeds to uh, to the movement um, and we're just discussing that internally if that's really the right thing to do like do I feel comfortable doing that is that does that make sense um, I mean we want to help the community we want to and we we thought like designing a product putting it out there putting all the proceeds to a, a movement and we're still kind of figuring that out so we don't have all the answers we don't and um, yeah, we, we, we work with, I think working with other designers uh, of color, working um, uh, with photographers, uh, working um, with other influencers. We're planning to do a post on interior designers, black interior designers to show what they have done and what, the, and, and, creative work that they have done so well it's great to see Ben Goods supporting the dialogue and you know with the mural at the storefront bringing together com the community and, and supporting the movement Ben Goods has such a unique use of material how did you arrive at wire as the main material mm -hmm. so um, I experimented with wire I played with wire I would make these figurine wire figures when I was growing up um that that kind of started it um but then i was designing my own space in my apartment back in detroit and i wanted a wire chair and um i was looking at these uh, 1950s Bertoya wire chair and then i was like well i've seen these around they've been around i what could i want to do something different i want to take it to the next level take it to the next uh refresh it in a way so uh, that's kind of what i started to do i was just playing around with the idea i draw i drew things i sketched uh sketched the idea and i came up with the concept like okay well maybe i have something here so i'm gonna go make a prototype and see how that works and so i made a prototype and i showed it to a bunch of people and they they we uh liked it so that's kind of how it started that's great. Do you have your own powder coating facility or is that outsourced? So we outsource our powder coating facility to someone here locally in Los Angeles. Yeah. How long has Ben Goods been around? And when did you decide that it was going to be the business that you wanted to focus on? Um, it's been around for 10 years and a couple of years before I even launched 
the brand. I experimented with different products. I even like created like a line of eco-friendly toothbrushes and uh, eco-friendly plates for, that were made out of these like banana type leaves. Um, nothing, it, it, it was a cool product, but I just didn't feel right to me. I mean, I wanted to be able to, uh, to visually tell a story, to enhance your space, be the, the house that you live in. I wanted to, in, or the space that you work out of, I wanted to be, be able to enhance the ghost spaces. So, um, yeah, after I made, I worked on a bunch of different products, product lines. And after one of them, I, I just felt like this was the right move. After I saw the prototypes, I felt like this is the right move. This is where I want to go. This is what excites me the most. That's important. Definitely really excited about mm -hmm. what you're doing. What responses did you receive from your original set of products, which encouraged in the which encouraged you in the strength of your idea and viability as a business? Mm -hmm. Right. So um, the first couple of years, I was really doing everything myself. Sometimes my dad would help me out with like invoicing and that sort of thing. But I, uh, when I launched the product, I also developed a website by myself. I was packaging things by myself. I was doing all the marketing by myself. And I could just see the momentum growing. I could see like there were magazine articles coming to me. I wasn't even doing anything. Somehow they found my website and they got excited. And that's really uh, kind of helped me build confidence in myself that, oh, people are really excited about this product line. And so that's kind of where it all kind of began. But for, as an entrepreneur, uh, if you're starting out your own business, I would suggest trying to do everything yourself in the beginning. Try not to, if you do, you don't really need a business partner. You can do it all on your own because having a business partner can, can create some other challenges for you where like you might have a disagreement and you might have to get approval. Um, so for me, it worked better. I just did it on my own and added because I had my own vision of what I wanted to portray out in the world and that's what I need to continue to do but I have a great team that now supports me and is along with the vision that I, I believe in so that's great as an entrepreneur what hardships have you faced and how have you overcome those mm -hmm. I think um Finding the right people to work with is always challenging because you might hire someone and they may think that it's the right fit, but after a month or two, you realize that this person has different set of values or different, um, uh, different way of doing things. And then you have to make a decision like, do I train that person? Do I... Uh, do I coach that person or do I let them go or and so that's always challenging is like figuring out working with people working with your team developing your team that's always a really challenging thing absolutely and in smaller teams I feel like it's even more important to make sure that everyone mm -hmm. is a good fit and there's good synergy amongst the group and exactly. you know it, for students, I think it's important when they're interviewing to make sure that they're keeping in mind that where they're interviewing is the right fit right. for them. Right, exactly. Uh, maybe they're good. Maybe they refer a bigger team in a larger company. Um, you know, that's that's awesome too, and uh, you, that's great. There's great learning in that as well. And uh, and we we are a small team, and we uh, and it's just it's like a family almost right now. So it's great. Absolutely. Do you explore materials in-house or you work with other companies? So we explore um, materials and designing. Everything of the, that is done in-house. Uh, right now, we, like I mentioned, we're designing an upholstery line. And that means creating, uh, I'm creating a sofa, basically. Never created a sofa. 
I don't know what goes inside of a sofa. I know there's wood in there. I know there's springs or some sort. I don't know how those wood pieces fit together. And um, there's some sort of way to make it sure everything is, is, is very strong. So you don't want that sofa to like creak and move around. Um, so that's a learning process that we're going through. And it's a fun learning process, uh, but it's also challenging. And we're learning by, by experimenting, um, creating those prototypes in-house, um, talking to uh, other uh, vendors that we work with. Um, we're learning about fabrics. Uh, I have a stack of fabrics behind me that I'm going through and it's, yesterday I got a whole bunch of fabrics and it was uh, from this um, manufacturer and it was like Christmas because I was so excited to get to play with all these fabrics and I can't wait to use it on the sofa. So um, that's the exciting part is making things for me. It sounds exciting. What materials would you consider experimenting with in the future? Um, we're, I'm really intrigued by plexiglass right now because it has uh, this iridescent, iridescent quality where you can see through it, comes in a variety of different colors. And, um, and it's also, it shields you from everybody else in a way. So um, in, in this day and age where everybody's trying to protect themselves, it's a really great material to protect yourself from uh, because you can easily clean it, wipe it off. So plexiglass. Yeah, we certainly have a, a couple questions about how COVID-19 has affected your business. Um, is, is plexiglass something that you're considering and rolling out in the new line that would yeah, be so geared more towards mm -hmm. protecting Plexiglass yourself? is something we're looking at. We're, uh, we're designing constantly. We design hundreds and hundreds of things, thousands of things every year, I don't know. And most of it, we don't even make. It's just like, it's, uh, oh, it's, it might be cool, but it's just not cool enough, or there isn't a market for it, or it's, it's just horrible. So there's just so many different things, factors that play into the, to something that we're designing. And um, COVID-19 threw a wrench in it because we all, we closed up the showroom uh, we all started working from home. So it provided some challenges for us. Like, how do we communicate? Uh, how many Zoom meetings are we going to do like a week? Um, we do a lot of chatting on, uh, through like Google chat. Uh, so that's, that's helpful. Um, it's a, it's a, it actually, it's created a lot more work for me because I have to figure out what are we doing? We're not all in one place anymore. It's like we're all in these different places and we can't come together to see how things are flowing and, and, and going. Um, and it's had an effect on our sales for sure, like, uh, with, like everybody else. So it's just like figuring out what projects are going to continue, what's not continuing, um, what products can we design and create for the future that are uh, people that are people going to want after we come out of this. So that's right. kind of where we're at. Could you walk us through Ben's good process from start to finish of creativity, idea generating, deciding you know which drawings to turn into models and then prototype, and then to the finished product? Mm -hmm. It's kind of um, it's kind of a bit all over the place. You know, we see something. Uh, that might uh, interest us or might excite us or inspire us. Uh, it might be a chair. It might be a rock. It might be uh, a fabric. It might be a material. Um, so it could be anything. And then, and then we sketch it up and then we make a model of it, make a 3D model of it. Um, because that's fairly easy to do nowadays. You can just quickly do it. And sometimes, a lot of the times, the 3D model looks awful, not what I'm envisioning at all. I hand it to someone else and I give them, and I give them tweaks and I tell them, oh, I like this, I don't like this, let's do this, it's too fat over here, it's too thin, it's just like the whole thing. So then we go back and, I, and, she, and she makes another 3D model. 
and I look at it and then we make more alterations and back and forth. And it's, it's, it's a long process. It could take, sometimes it's really quick. It's like, oh, okay, we hit it on right the first go. Other times it could take like a year or two years. And like the wooden wire chair that we just released, we came up with so many different versions of how that wood and that wire are gonna look together. Like what is that pattern on the back of that wire gonna look like? And um, eventually we're like, okay, we like this. Let's just do it. Let's, we don't, we're not gonna ditch this whole product idea. We're gonna go for it, we're gonna make it. And so we made a prototype and we went for it. And sometimes we make prototypes and we look at it and uh, we just cut it and we don't, we don't use it. And other times we look at a prototype that looks really cool, but then we change the whole thing and we redo it. We just, we last year we released a chair called the Rachel chair. It's a very simple chair. Um, and we wanted to add a stool to it. And we made a stool and the stool didn't look right. And we, and for some reason, it wasn't matching the chairs as, as it should have. And we made it in 3D a bunch of times and we uh, trashed that. And finally, finally, we even released it and we showed it to people. And um, then we even made changes after that, after we showed it. So finally, finally, we're just getting to the point where we're really happy with it and we're going to re-release the stool. So it's a little messy at times. Yes, it is. We're a small company, but it's fine. You know, that's, that's the way it goes. Yeah. It's all part of the process. All part of the process. On the business side, what is your day to day like and how do you, you know, balance the creative designing process with the business side of things? Mm -hmm. um, day to day is kind of all different all the time. Um, I, if I had my way, I would just be creating stuff all day long. And sometimes that doesn't, that doesn't usually always happen. Um, but I wake up early in the morning. I'm a morning person. I think as an entrepreneur, you have to wake up early. That's, this, that's the way I feel. Uh, and for me, I need to do some sort of exercise in the morning, whether it's yoga or uh, walking or running or something. I need, uh, need to do some sort of exercise. And that really gets me going. And, and I get dressed and I get on the emails and I check in with my employees. Now it's all through it's basically chatting with my employees because we're not face to face anymore. And um, with the team and I'm checking in to see what we're designing and where we are with designs and checking in to see um, if we're making modifications to the website. We need to take uh, new pictures. What, where are we going with social media? How do we have to, uh, where, what are we planning for the next week or two? Or what things are happening that we have to change our, our social media and message? So, um, so the, really the right authentic message is being sent out there. Um, and then it's also uh, trying to figure out how our customers are doing, um, checking in on emails on that, uh, with our checking in on emails with our sales manager um, and our customer service. So it's constantly changing, evolving, all those things. It's not, it's not like I'm designing from nine to 10 in the morning and then the rest of the day I'm doing something else and then I'm going to pick it up at three and four again. It's like, it's always changing and flowing. If I might have an idea at noon and I want to I want to see what that looks like. I send it off, that off to the design team and we build it and we see what it looks like in 3D. And then we go from there and we modify and we change. Mm -hmm. what, so, tip, what tips do you have for young people who want to start their own business? Um, I would say be passionate about what you want to design, what you want to make, whether it's clothing or whether it's furniture or whether you want to be an architect or uh, you want to be a car designer, just be really passionate and excited about what you want to do. And then really kind of build, build your skills around that. And 
once you've developed those skills and skills are always learning, uh, but be really, really on it, really, really start developing things. Um, and if you want and develop prototypes of what you are interested in, if it is in fashion, start sewing all this time and, and developing your prototypes and um, get, it, get, get some feedback from people that, uh, that you really respect and find some mentors out there that you really respect. And you can really kind of go from there and see, it's just, it's just really kind of diving into the whole process um, and you'll learn as you go along. And we're all learning, we're always learning. So that's kind of what I, that's what I feel. So. If you're a designer just starting out, it can be a challenge to get access to space or equipment. What's some advice to help overcome that? Mm -hmm. um, that's, that can be challenging and depending upon where you are living, that can also be uh, uh, challenging. Like if you're um, in some place rural where they don't have the equipment that you need, that can be challenging. I, don't, I, don't, um, hmm. I think if you can find places uh find a place where you can collaborate with there i know in la there's some there's some there's some shops where people rent out individual spaces uh in the whole this whole collective of shops where individual designers are working from so this is like one giant warehouse space and there are these individual people one person might be doing ceramics Another person is doing like glass blowing. Another person might be doing welding. So within that whole area, if you can find that, that would be really, I think a really great environment to be involved in. Um, yeah. The play of positive negative space with the wireframes creates rich shadows. Do these shadows or non-tangible considerations ever influence the furniture design? Oh, for sure, for sure. Because the, the furniture can live indoors and it can also learn outdoors. And we have lots of sun in Southern California. So that sun coming through the chairs creates this really cool pattern on the floor, on the concrete. And that, that's also part of the language, the message. It creates, it creates some depth to the whole product line. It creates some depth to the brand and it, it definitely it has an influence on what we create. How do you approach designing the different products to fit various interior styles? Mm -hmm. Well, we think our product really can fit into any type of interior style, whether it is a very modern house or whether it is something more historian or historic or whether it may be uh, something more ornate. And I think just by changing the color, if you took our Lucy chair from a bright orange, it could look beautifully in Palm Springs, in a backyard pool. Or if you took that same chair, that Lucy chair, with all those, even with those intricate triangles on the back, you make it black and it fits in into a very kind of more subtle environment, um, a brownstone somewhere in New York, you know, it can really fit in the variety of different, um, it's very versatile. We have a question on what your favorite piece is, as well as which piece has presented the biggest challenge. <laughs> um, the biggest challenge piece, um, I would say, is the, is the love seat because it has so many curves. And to manufacture that, it's really challenging. It has lots of curves. It's very big. How do you make sure the wires are going to support all the weight? It's supposed to meant to, to hold for two people. So we were able to add uh, like stronger wires underneath, uh, not taking away too, uh, 
the design too much. Um, but just, and we were able to reinforce the back of it with some doubling up the wires on the sides of the back. So that was a challenging piece to create. Um, as far as my favorite piece to make, I think it's the piece that I haven't made yet. And that's, that's the piece that I'm actually in the process of making is that sofa. It's a sectional sofa. It's really cool. And I hope it turns out well. Um, we're in the process of prototyping it. And, and it's, that's the, the exciting part is just making that next piece. So um, yeah, I can't wait to see it. Hopefully this week I'll get to see it. So nice. Yeah. Well, we certainly can't wait to see what else is coming out of Ben Goods. What role does sustainability play in your design process? Um, it definitely plays a big a part as far as the materials that we use. They're recyclable materials. Um, they can be, if you, for some reason, you're done with the chair, you can take it to a metal yard and it can be melted, melt down, and it can be reused. Um, so the, the material can be reused over and over again. The chair itself can be, if you get a scratch on it, the finish, if the skin finish gets scratched, scratched on it, it can be re-powder coated and be re, um, re um, brought brand to look brand new again into any color you want. If you want purple, you can make it purple. If you want green, you can make it purple. So it can be reused and reused over and over again. And as far as the packaging, we try to keep the packaging as small as possible. We, the legs of the chairs come off in some of the chairs. So we ship, can ship like two chairs per box. So that really condenses things. Um, so we really try to uh, reduce our carbon footprint that way. Do you collaborate with any artists or designers outside of the in-house team? Um, we have in the past for doing some interesting projects like making a mural or many years ago, we created this, uh, a chair where we wrapped, uh, the artist would, was wrapping fabric around the chair or yarn around the chair, so and color blocking the chair. So more in kind of like an art installation type of a way, we collaborate with outside artists. Um, you know, we only have so many hours in the day to work and we're just so busy with what we do in-house that it's sometimes really hard to collaborate with outside artists. Uh, but we like to when we can, when it makes, when it seems fit, when it makes it seems like a good fit. Right. How do you approach your work to human centric design? Um, hmm. Like as far as uh, like the comfort of the chair or? Yeah, let's go with really that. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, just being able to look at uh, the chair itself and being after seeing the prototype and sitting in it and feeling like, is this comfortable? Is this not? Where is the wires hitting our back? Um, so yeah, just kind of really being able to sit in that prototype is very important for uh, helping us improve the, quality, the comfort levels. Yeah, and I think that leads us into the next question of when you're designing chairs, besides examining the aesthetic visuals of the design, do you think about the environment and mood you want to create with the chair for the users? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, some of our products have been like the cloud bench is, is pretty wild and, wild and loud out there and that's not going to fit in, in everybody's home. Um, that's just a certain part of the certain type of place that that would go in. And so we look at that, we want to, we want to be able to fit in something like that and something loud and extravagant, but then also like the Rachel chair, it's very simple, clean chair that can fit into any environment. So we like look at both. We try to like design products that kind of fit in all sorts of, uh, areas. And then that's just to keep us keep us interested for our own self, I think. Keep us, think, keep things interesting for ourselves. Great, well, I think that's all the time that we have today. I know we still have a ton of really great questions. Uh, so I just wanna let students know that we will be getting back to you with answers to all of those. One final question for you is, 
any last advice or words for the students that have tuned in today? Um, I would say, again, just to jump in to what you really want to do. Like, don't get caught up in having to have all the education that you need. Don't get caught up in trying to get that master's degree that you might need to really get. Just jump in. If you really are passionate about something and it makes sense, jump in and do it. Great advice. Gora, I want to say a huge thank you for taking the time to join us today and give us such an informative presentation about Ben Goods, about your design journey. Uh, students, if you'd like to learn more about Ben Goods, you can visit bengoods.com or their Instagram at bengoods. We thank you so much for joining us for the Original America's Virtual Fellowship Program. If you'd like to learn more about the organization or upcoming talks, you can visit theoriginalamericas.com or our Instagram, theoriginalusa. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.